We're live. Hello, my name is Steve Jaguer. And I'm Mike Foster. Welcome once again to... All right. Uh, what do we got going on this week? <laughs> well, we're back after a little hiatus because last week there was the Cloud Native Security Meetup. Right, so we saw Jonah Jones and Daniel O talk a little bit about Quarkus serverless, more for Java apps, uh, as well as Falco. So you're know, detecting runtime, how to make all that collection cool. So check that out, Kubernetes Security TV. And yeah, a lot of a lot of news since we missed uh, last week. So good to be it's, back. It actually makes it harder to actually yeah, easier and harder to try and come up with uh, subjects because now I've got twice as many um let's say alerts and newsletters and videos and stuff that crosses our path so there's a lot of curating serious mm -hmm. curating that needs to happen but um in the show we have new cves we've yeah, got a new fun quiz for fun. you a quiz yeah we didn't mention that in the title uh a quiz we'll see well yeah, don't no pressure if you're watching this now or later um it's easy it's easy um, some fun WTFs and uh, what is the a really good article about multi-tenancy, which is a super hot topic, right? Mm -hmm. and we'll, so we'll go through a bit of that. And that actually will be a bit of foreshadowing for tool time where we'll talk about a few things, but more specifically, uh, Kyverno, which is a policy engine for Kubernetes specifically. And I got a bit of an education, a uh, shameless plug, because I interviewed... Jim Baguadia, who is one of the founders of Nermata, who make Kyverno for my podcast this week. So in the next couple of weeks, hopefully by the end of the month, look for that on my podcast and you can learn even more about Kyverno. But anywho, plug over. Do you have anything, anything going on that you always have things going on that you could plug early in the show? Yeah, just the just the meetup. And uh, you know, if you like what you're watching, obviously, like, subscribe, whichever, if you're on Twitch or YouTube, you know how to find us. And again, you can always contact us at the email or anything like that below. So that's all I got for you. Oh yeah, we should stick the banner up that uh, that tells the world how to get a hold of us. And we have viewers too, I think. Yeah. Uh, or maybe it's just me watching on the other browser, mm -hmm. but you can do that. There we go. I'll put the banner up. So Twitter, YouTube, and and if you're if you if you're watching us on YouTube, and other than the thumbs up, why not share the show on Reddit? or share the show on a Facebook group or share the show on LinkedIn so that other people learn about this so that we get more live viewers. Not that we, you know, are giant narcissists that need live viewers, but we just little are. ones. Yeah. Just little ones. Yeah. All right. Fun stuff. Yeah. Let's, let's crack onward. Are we going to do quiz first? Yeah. Let's start with the, start with the quiz. Fun stuff <laughs> that uh, we stumble upon. Let me share my screen up then. Uh, dude, I didn't actually share in advance. It's okay though. We're gonna get by. There it is. Don't share the bing bong. There it is. Cool, cool. No shock. Yeah. And so we, we first stumbled upon this. We were just thinking, what do we want to do with this? Do we want to take the quiz? What happens if this is hard? And if you go, uh, so there's that, but then there's the infographic. If you were yeah. to go one more link over, do you have that one as well? Yeah. So this this links the actual graphic of the private company who did the study. And so we were thinking, okay, well, how hard is this quiz? And these are the answers, or the questions, I should say. Yeah, which uh, we don't really know what the multiple choice offer answers were, but we're like, which of the fall? I can imagine which of the following passwords would outsmart a hacking attack. I'm obviously visualizing password one with an exclamation point, uh, and then. I don't know. Was a complete list of garbage. What's What's fun about this is if you go through some of them, could be hard. Like, how does ransomware work? That's actually a pretty big answer mm -hmm. if you want to get techy about it. But obviously, there wasn't a technical answer there. Um, I like that people seem to know that if you US if you put a USB drive in, but don't run anything, it can still be harmful. Seventy percent. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. revealing. Yeah, and if you think about it, 50% uh, if it was random choice for a true or false. So that means you probably have a significant that no, or at least have some sort of grasp on it. 
Uh, the yeah. it, you, if you can you can tell though that the true and false questions at seventy and seventy one percent are a little misleading as opposed to like how does ransomware work if it's a four choice multiple choice question mm. you're fifteen points above right the the random choice selection so yeah it's yeah it is good and then eight true cybersecurity <laughs> eight percent undo well that's see there you go that's like along the stats of the type of answer you'd have to do, do so true or false 50 50 uh like you said probably four choices in some cases where you get 39 percent, and then where you have like freedom mm -hmm. which of the following file types could be harmful it depends how many file types are there right and there's a lot that'll catch you out. Like people might think a PDF, probably commonly people think PDFs could be safe and they're not. There's all sorts mm -hmm. of vulnerabilities associated with PDFs. And the same thing goes for document types. Like maybe that's gonna mess people up, file types. So those are those are pretty, those are the two lowest scores. Are, are they? File types would be harmful. And what would you do to keep a document safe? 8%. Mm -hmm. I wanna know what wildcard thing was in there. Yeah, there has that to be everyone got wrong right <laughs> but did you want to mention the percentage uh the age demographic bit? Uh, yeah i think it was a little bit above there but uh, the failed rate by age is closer to the top and 84 percent of 18 to 24 year olds uh failed yeah i've got the reverse here i've got 16 percent passing you've got 84 percent in this yeah. document here and so you need like... to get you need to get four of seven questions right to pass so you think about it, like, this is a very simple spoomed. quiz. Two of them are true and false. So yeah, not really looking great. <laughs> um, and then I, I did, so it's 57 for 25 to 34, 58 for 35 to 44, 62 for 45 to 54, and then 57, 54 up, which is kind of averaged across. Like it's very, uh, in terms of standard deviation, it's very close. So mm, really it's the, the youngins that need to catch up. So if you're, I mean, I think there's this uh, sort of image of an older generation not really being good with tech, but just because you can post Instagram doesn't mean you go with tech. Right. I'm going to, okay, so this is going to seem a weird thing to do during the show, but I can see my dog running through the field. So, <laughs> and I have to text my wife now to say, uh, our dog's in the field. So this is like, this is live disaster because our dog, my dog should not be half a mile away in that field. Um, continue. Let's go with the next subject, <laughs> multi-tenancy for Kubernetes, because I know yeah. you love to talk about that. Yeah, I can rant on this just... a little bit. Where is the... As he goes so, and rants, but... or tries to hunt down his dog. But ta introduce multi-tenancy for uh, Kubernetes while I tell Ali that Genie yeah. is run on it. Let's see. All right. So the new Kubernetes blog, uh, three tenancy models for Kubernetes. It, just in, in terms of multi-tenancy for Kubernetes, Kubernetes wasn't built for multi-tenant, um, just multi-tenancy in general, right? It's more of a orchestration tool built by Google, but there really wasn't a thought process as to having multiple people working in a cluster at the same time. And it, reflects that in terms of workflow, but there's been significant work to be done in order to kind of create uh, a method where people can leverage Kubernetes, but also do it in a safe and secure way. So a lot of work being done by um, uh, Adrian, especially I saw a talk by Adrian at a meetup at a Canadian meetup talking about this and it's talking about hierarchical namespaces. So basically just an abstraction of RBAC policies and a way that you can group uh, it, it's basically like adding another level to our back. So pretty interesting as a conversation, especially when I used to work in a, in a research center to do this, it would be extremely useful to be able to separate users by namespace. And then just when you are given a namespace, you have all these walls set up. So, you know, you have your role bindings, you have resource quotas on the namespace already configured and, you know, then you can kind of configure them, especially at uh, like a group or project setting. I think Rancher already somewhat does this too, right? They mm -hmm. they have the sort of abstraction in their management plane where they're saying, okay, you're part of this group. It means you have access to these clusters, right? And to a certain extent, Google has that as well, just to, like when you look at projects, but really haven't seen that much inside the cluster. So I think it's uh, 
It'd be interesting. I, I actually want to try to demo this, the hierarchical namespace controller, eventually. That'd be cool. Yeah. Where's yeah? I was gonna say, where's that link to? Is there um, a larger article that we can? Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Oh, so it's by that guy. There you go. Yeah. And it's just the limits of namespaces, right? And uh, we've talked about anti patterns with namespaces for a while now, and how they're used and how they're misused. And you know, one of the issues with hierarchical namespaces is saying, "Hey, here are the boundaries that you can work within as a user," and then running into friction that way too. So, yeah, there's no common concept of ownership, right? I think that's probably one of the biggest things. Yeah, it seems as multiple namespaces, it doesn't have any record of the common owner. So, one of the goals being is. You're a developer. You have access to this, this namespace. Here are the three boundaries we set for you. Everything is yours within it. If anything goes wrong, it's on you, right? So pretty cool. Cool. Can you go to the original article and zing back up to the top for a second? Because that's the relevant thing that for me that I caught, which we'll, again, bring up later and bring it up while I'm talking about it, is one of the other contributors here was Jim Baguaria, which is the guy I actually mentioned at the beginning of this in my shameless plug who I interviewed for to talk about Kyverna, which I'm gonna talk about later on. So it's interesting that he was a part of this because what I discovered earlier in the week and what we'll talk about at the end is that there are ways of creating things when you provision namespaces using it. So some of the problems uh, that are kind of indicated in namespaces as a service uh, about having default network policies in place can be solved with that. So that, that I thought was, interesting and accidentally tied into the demo that I was going to do this week. We'd already planned. So that's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. awesome. All right. I can confirm by the way, the dog has been brought back onto the premises. It's all good. I'll stand, <laughs> stand down, stand yeah. down. DSO training is having a good laugh about that. So yeah. All right. All right. New CVE. So we bring that up. Oh yeah. Bingo validating admission webhook does not observe some previous fields. Yes. Have you dove into this? Uh, a little bit. I, I believe it's been fixed in some of the newer versions, if I'm remembering correctly. Well, can, there's fix, there's there's some here you can actually see it's um it's gonna zoom in, but yeah. It's yeah, there's already fixes in place. It's more this is one of those things where like legacy is gonna bite come back to bite you. Mm-hmm. So it's you can see that it only impacts validating admission plugins that rely on old values in certain fields and does not impact calls from couplets that go through the built-in no restriction admission plugin, et cetera, et cetera. So it's it's a weird combination. It's only a medium, so low likelihood of exposure. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you mentioned legacy. I mean, there still are a bunch of people that are on 115, right? Totally. There's... And I, there must be stats on people who are using unsupported versions of Kubernetes that have all any manner of much worse vulnerabilities than this. Yeah, uh, there was actually a, a good conversation on Twitter and people talking about how it's hard, like we shouldn't really be shaming you know people for not being able to get off one one five because organizations you know have a long time and stuff like that. And I don't think. When, when people are talking about upgrading versions, I don't think they're necessarily talking about shaming the developers or the operators that have issues with this. It's that we should be shaming the business for not making this a priority, right? Mm. Like that really, I think, should be the thought is you need to have some sort of process in place for these upgrades, um, even if there totally. are some sort of deprecating APIs from 115 to 116. Like that should be something that should be escalated at this point, right? I mean, there's been enough documentation and conversation around it that it should be. Anyways, my two cents. Hey, I get it. That's cool. That uh well it's like that's it's an age old problem, isn't it? Except things move so quickly in the world of Kubernetes that if you're using one that's over a year old, it's it's not supported. And that's in some people's minds, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. People are using Windows XP still. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, slightly Slightly different as an OS, but <laughs> I know, I know, but it's just that's how people sometimes think. They just think, wow, it's a couple years old, it'll be fine. In fact, if anything, maybe it's more stable because it's older or something, you know. 
change yeah. has risk upgrades have risk so the people making any form of change can be seen as adding risk not removing it but i think uh, there the is there here. is also less risk at speed too though right because yeah. the faster things are upgrading the the harder it is for uh for people to take advantage of malicious code or or issues with code right like the development cycle works so moves so quickly now that let's say you introduce a bug but then we catch it well it's patched six weeks later right that's, that's what's it. actually more crazy about like the exchange server hacks and things like that is you know how long has that that like malicious code been sitting there how long was it exploited yeah. right i know i know it's out there somewhere i just forget but you know, there's something to be said about about developing at speed to to make things safe mm. Totally. That's that's a good philosophy. All right. Awesome. Uh, do you want to do you want to talk about the Zoom one? You brought that in. Uh, the, boo, boo, boo. So I, I have it up. I can do it. Yeah. Zoom so we don't again. know we don't know all the details behind this vulnerability, but it's a zero day vuln, and it can be used to launch uh, an RCE attack, remote code execution. This is the this is the second third time that Zoom's had. A pretty significant CVE. Uh, the They've got a bit of a reputation. Yeah, the researchers who who found it earned two hundred thousand for the discovery. Oh, so, wow. nice. I yeah. mean, luckily it was obviously found by the right people, at least that we know of. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we'll we'll follow this one and make sure that we keep you updated when these things come out because it seems like it's in an active patch. So if you're using Zoom, whatever the next update is, probably worth an update. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, the moment something's revealed like this, we always say this, that as um, soon as a vulnerability becomes public, it can be, if it can be automated and weaponized, somebody's gonna do it. Mm -hmm. All right, are we on, uh, that's our news done, I think. New section done? Yes, yes, yes. Yep. All right, CVs. new section. Uh, oh. All right, first in our WTF section was the China one. Yes, that is Bitcoin. And then this isn't a traditional Bitcoin one. I'm not going to sit there again. To the moon. This was a BBC article, therefore no advertising. Very nice. Bitcoin could derail China's climate change targets. Bitcoin is mostly mined there. It's 75% of Bitcoin mining is in, is in China. I don't understand quite why that is. Because there used to be a ton in Iceland in really cold regions where cooling um, the, the miners essentially was more cost effective. So when it all moved to China, I don't know. Like you don't need people. It's not like it's cheap labor, but nevertheless, um, Bitcoin mining is so carbon intensive. It's going to threaten the country's emission targets. This some is awesome. rural areas in China are popular among Bitcoin miners, mainly due to the cheaper electricity prices and undeveloped land to house the servers. Ah, uh, there we go. That's it. China's huge. So yeah. why, why aren't, why aren't we mining in Canada? There's a lot of <laughs> land going on there. <laughs> yeah, a lot of land. It's pretty cold too. So you have that going for you. It's pretty cold. You got everything going on. It's just Northwest Territories. What's going on up there? We it's already spend. Bitcoin. Yeah, we already spend a significant amount of energy on heating during the winter. So we can kind of offset just, that. Just put that's what we do. Bitcoin we burn. Yeah, mining. we use Bitcoin, and then we use the server heat to then heat homes. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, there you go. That's it. That that could be a solution. So you should be a politician. At its peak, it could account for 5.41% 5 of China's electricity generation. Bitcoin mining. Yeah. It's nuts. That, that's... It's, yeah, I don't know. Mixed anyway. feelings on Bitcoin. We could talk all show about it. Let's... Oh. Uh... <laughs> that, that's a, a big WTF. I don't know. I, that's just insane. Is that why we're in a chip uh, shortage right now? This is where all the chips are going? Oh, the what? Yeah, we're in a process. Oh, of shortage, to, to right? Bitcoin miners. I, I, you know what? It probably is. For a while, 
when Bitcoin like boomed last time in 2017 uh, slash 18, everyone was mining and then it, it lost value and suddenly people weren't, it wasn't really cost effective because even though it, you do get rewards based on value, when it drops suddenly, it's not cool because it's not reacting. And um, that happens and nobody, but now it's like, probably very valuable, right? Because it's a, it's like 60,000 for a Bitcoin now. Uh, so crazy, I guess, I guess everyone's mining again. It's cool again. Yeah. And, uh, another WTF, I guess you put out there was Coinbase was valued, uh, larger than BP on his first day of IPO. Yeah. Yeah. So crazy. <laughs> yeah that's that's also crazy that's that's bonkers i know that's all right I, we should have had that as our big spender darn we missed it we didn't yeah, think we had a big spender category technically counts that's but yeah money all right we'll let it go this time hey let's go on to the lawsuit shall we do that yes let's do it all right red hat technically yeah, being... ibm how, how do you, how do you say that do you think zinuous zinuous I'm not sure. Zinu, yeah, Zinu, well, intellectual property stolen to build and sell the product. Let's bump that up a little bit as well. Yeah, Red Hat wrongfully <laughs> copied software code. It's basically they're using Linux and they're saying that they're using. I've yeah, I've never even heard of this company. Have you? Not until this. It it seems ridiculous. It, there's a lot of text here, yeah. So we should put it in there. It seemed ridiculous when I first read it, and then I read it again and kind of went, eh, "Big companies do things." So I'm sure, the, the the I think the the highlighted thing is by dominating the Unix Linux server operating system market, competing open source operating systems like their free BSD based Open Server Ten have been pushed out of the market. So yeah. they're arguing that because Red Hat backs RHEL and Linux and Linux-based operating systems, that FreeBSD-based op Open Server 10 is getting pushed out of the open source market, which is anti-competitive in the open source market. How? That's yeah. that's the complaint here. Is that be so? It and this is mm. the thing is, so I'm a let's say you're <laughs> in a tech company, and you want to back open source projects. Well. If I'm backing an open source project, then if that open source project becomes extremely successful, the other open source projects gets to sue you for being competitive yeah. in the open source community. I don't know. I don't know how much that weight that holds, but yeah, it's a bit. It's a bit bonkers. It does get kind of funny way down at the bottom here. Let me just move down here, where they essentially accuse IBM and Red Hat of sort of collusion uh, in certain terms of having different versions and then ibm buying red hat thus quartering the market on yeah on linux right i think and i think there's a, there's also a reason that this is getting filed in the virgin islands because it's <laughs> specifically copyright infringement under the sherman antitrust act the clayton antitrust act the virgin islands anti-monopoly act so let's just say there's a reason it got filed out there <laughs> mm, yeah so fun but, anyway I, I, uh, I'm just, I, I think the whole open source aspect to this really is interesting to see how the courts are going to see this. Cause I don't know. I, I just hope you get a very qualified judge who understands what they're talking about. Yeah, that's true. Actually, this is right? kind of a weird subject for uh, somebody to have to contend with. Maybe that's part of the reason that they've thrown it in, throw that out there is that they think they can position it or frame it in a way that they might get a favorable ruling from a judge mm -hmm. who doesn't quite understand. Yeah, I don't know. It's an interesting one. I don't think you can really argue about uh, competitive behavior in open source, but no, yeah, it's bonkers. It doesn't, it doesn't add up. But oh well. Okay. Anyways, we'll see what happens. We'll try and follow it and see. That could take years, though, right? That's oh yeah. That's probably never gonna come come to anything that we will find out about. Uh, next WTF. Yeah, it's a good one. <laughs> I, 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 let's just do this. Uh, let's make him really big. Can I, can I, can I expand this just so it's good? Like, 
man, they love putting flattering right. pictures of him up there, huh? <laughs> yeah. It's, they just catch him on a Zoom. And just, this is like earlier when you were you were frozen. I tried to screen capture an embarrassing photo of you. Uh, imagine, I guarantee you, if I was ever on a Zoom with Mark Zuckerberg, I would be constantly trying to screen capture some awful shot like this of him. Yeah, get some good memes. Anyway, yeah. A database containing stolen phone numbers of more than half a billion Facebook users is being freely traded online. Uh, did you read this? Because it's, it's old data. Yeah. So it's like there that this is this is a bit of clickbait if you just this cross your path it's vice so you know uh another canadian media company blame blame canada again says it's your fault that hackers got half a billion not really it's it this is this this is like um cambridge analytica again it's the same ability to scrape their api that they canceled so that you couldn't do it anymore and a lot of this data comes from before that some of the some of the dodgy stuff that it gets into a little later was where they're talking about and you can see they're quoting cambridge analytica there some of the dates on the data looks a bit funny mm -hmm. like they like had 2019 dates and so they're like well hold on you were supposed to have fixed it before that date so why was it still there and uh, then there's another years. guy saying yeah and there's a guy who's also saying hold on, I deleted my account in 2015. Like, why was my data in a 2017 scrape? Yeah. Yeah, if you've With... used Facebook lately, you have probably seen that they allow you to delete and erase all of your data now as well, right? So as part of the new updates that they've pushed, they also specifically allow you to copy, get a full, and Google does this as well, and I'm sure it's kind of going to become the, the standard, the commonplace, but... You have to go get all your data, download it, see what has been accessed, and then delete it all from their servers. Well, that's what they tell you. I'm assuming they have to. <laughs> yeah, I. They're supposed to. I, I don't know. I, I think it's it's it is interesting since since uh, Cambridge Analytica and since in the UK or Europe, I should say, the GDPR came in and gave you well required the right for deletion of your existence. So everyone who, if you're a European citizen, you have the right to say, delete me and everything connected to me. And so both Google and Facebook made that actually really easy to do now. Uh, just to, whether they do it, you know, you can do it. Mm -hmm. By the way, I didn't put this in, but I forgot to mention that Google has pushed, do you remember we talked about third-party cookies and Google's flock? Oh yeah. Uh, so Google, as part of their new update, has implemented Flock in some browsers, in a few browsers. Mm -hmm. And you can check. Now, it hasn't been implemented in uh, Europe, specifically because of GDPR. But there is, I'm putting this in the chat, is miflocked.org. So if you run a Chrome update, a specific amount of browsers are running this, uh, this Flock algorithm instead of, and it's also running third-party cookies at the same time. And the goal is to eventually remove third-party cookies and just use the flock algorithm. But that also remains to be seen. Oh. Yeah. So Very Google's cool. trying to design a way for advertisers to keep targeting users based on their web browsing, but without cookies. So you don't have that legislation or issue. But then, you know, legislation is just going to catch up. Yeah. That's... Uh, that's very cool. I like it. I like it. I'm going to try it. I'm not going to try. It. I was just tempted to try it live. I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. So you can't opt out of the flock trial. You just have to disable third party cookies. Yeah. There you go. So nothing will work. But yeah, exactly. Awesome. All right. Cool. Good update. Small side note. Yeah. Thanks for for joining into the rant. Yeah. No worries. That was good. That was good. All right. I'm gonna throw the meme, the meme update up there. Meme of the day. Uh, let me share with it. Meme of the day. It's not to do with a boat stuck in a in a canal. It, it's uh, most of us lads. Most of us lads working on how we present our Kubernetes setup to management. How we actually work with our cluster. <laughs> Yay! Yeah. More yeah, more memes. A... <laughs> yeah, at least it's not a container ship or anything like that. 
No, so. it's that's a good one. 525 yeah. people bump that up. That rocks. That is cool. All right, hold on. I'm going to put a request out to people watching this, which is where's the banners? Where's the banners? Where's the banners? Send us more memes. Yeah, there we go. All the memes. All right. That's that's perfect. Okay, so I think we're near the end of kind of newsy things, WTFs. Uh, we're going to get into some geek now, uh, but you wanted to readdress uh, one two one. Or yeah, do do just you know, we we talked about it a little bit, and I touched on it at the at the meetup last week. But Sysdig has done a write up, and then Aqua came out, and it was more security specific. So talking about PSP deprecation. Uh, and then talking about IPv4, IPv6, dual stack support, uh, admission controllers to block the external service IPs. So that was the CVE that originally came out, uh, the man in the middle attack, right? Right. That came out, uh, was it December or November last year? So that also was addressed using an admission controller and adding external client Go credential providers as well. That was one of the other issues. But just more of the features that are security specific that they want to touch on. It seemed like right. this, this version was focused on a lot more functionality, jobs, uh, running jobs in the clusters, and promoting things to either stable or deprecating. There was a lot of things that were added, but they're, they're relatively small. No, no like major new features that, that came out of this release. OK. Yeah, I think part of it was, you know, since we were doing Kyverno and PSP is being deprecated, it was sort of a call out for what exactly is going to take the orchestration around security context, right? Mm. UID, GIDs, and all these moving forward. And even though Kubernetes is working on a solution, is it going to be the one that's actually implemented? It's also a fair question. Yeah, totally. Cool. Excellent. All right, tool time. It's every time we get the tool time, I, I kick myself for not having made the little uh, the intro intro thing. So, ah, all right. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll write a song next week so that I, we can have some intro that says tool time. So there's three things in tool time. And one was, one was pretty cool. That was a systemd cheat sheet that came from opensource.com uh, where I've got it up here actually. And I can, uh, I should, I could cheat the system because uh, you're supposed to go here and sell your soul. I've already done it, and and there it is, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's is it? I, I think cheat sheets should always be on one page. Otherwise, it's cheat sheets, plural, yeah. right? But it's good. Uh, Systems is a pain in the butt. I don't use it often enough to remember anything. So uh, a cheat sheet is a good thing to have. Um, you use what's your system D experience? Are you a master? Oh, no, intermediate mostly. Okay. Yeah, I, I learned a lot of system D specifically for the CKA, actually. Yeah, because it comes up like in journal CTL comes up and things like that. So it's mm -hmm. it's useful to know essentially the, the fundamentals in a cheat sheet is, is cool, but also it's just good because open open source.com has a ton of pretty awesome cheat sheet. So even though you got to sell your soul a little bit to get this thing, well, actually you don't have to now. If you if you just cut, if you <laughs> screen capture the URL across the top, you probably could just bypass the system and go get it now without having to do it. But it's a worthwhile thing to sign up to opensource.com because uh, it's one of the things that we use to curate some of the content from the show because they send lots of cool stuff to, to you and Jessica Cherry does writing for it. So check her yeah. out as well. Yeah, it's honestly a pretty good newsletter just for, for yeah. email and it's not spam either they're very no. curated and very specific about the content that goes out so worth the sign up yeah totally worth more than others uh the other one i want to talk about i threw in here and i have not zero time to look at this because this got sent to me today not long before this kub striker can't deny i like the logo that's pretty might be a good t-shirt but it oh, is yeah. again yeah, very nice. But it's another check. So it is Kubernetes agnostic, works equally well, apparently, and it checks different configurations for security misconfigurations and challenges. So I don't know how deep it goes. The little animated GIF looks pretty cool, but I think 
maybe by next week, unless we have another demo at some point, we should do our usual thing. And like this looks super easy to have a go with written in Python. So if you're keen on it, I think go take a look. I haven't I haven't done any more than bring up the GitHub and and check it out. Mm -hmm. So that's that's on my radar to play with. Cool. Yeah, this is pretty interesting. I like this. Yeah, you're looking Let's at take it? a look. Yeah. Yeah, let me play around on over oh, the weekend. Yeah. yeah. If it's worthy of a, a show demo, then yeah, let's do it. Speaking of show demos, we're 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 timing this very well. Uh, I mentioned this week I did an interview. Ah, there's his LinkedIn. There we go. Let's let's name and shame. But this dude, because he's been super present in my world, just like on LinkedIn, and on, I saw I've seen him on. He was on OpenShift Commons, uh, I think, uh, a week or two ago, and it's just everywhere. And he, and I and I didn't I didn't associate Nermata. Like I saw Nermata, and I'm like, what is going on? This guy loves Caverno. Of course, then I worked out that Nermata, it's like Styra and Opa. It's the it's the company that makes the thing that you know, but you don't know the company, right? Mm -hmm. He's one of the founders, along with I think it's Ritesh Patel, who's his co-founder. And they made Kyverno, which is a Kubernetes native policy management. Uh, I did some homework and research. You can click and learn more. The get started was brain dead enough. Like if you look at, this is the getting started. Let me just scroll down. Is nothing. Like there's nothing to this. So much so that I thought, right, well, that's that's easy. You know, on MacBooks, if you double click the wrong way, it, it, it tries to, sh it, it insists that I, so I have a kind cluster. You can see, I just fired it up. Mm -hmm. So this is as fresh, fresh as it gets, right? There's not the, I'll get pods. Okay, bang. There should just be kind crap in there. Let's just make sure it works. <laughs> All right, great. Nothing in there. So I, I'm going to do the nasty and do that see what it sticks in there. So you got CRDs, cluster roles, config map, service deployment, uh, Groovy. Looks good. Let's check again. OK, so I've got a Kyverno thing running uh, and an init. And we can sit and look at it initialize. So what fascinated me about looking into Kyverno at a glance, right? And let's go back and let's kill that so I don't have to deal with it was I'll just pause on here because this is the first policy and, and it, maybe I can make it a little bit bigger in case you're watching it on a phone or something. But it's it's just YAML. And so it's a new CRD, which is the cluster policy and the short form for the uh, object is cpoll uh, if you want to check them out. And it gives you a way of specifying whether it's validating, mutating, or generating a rule around it and then it has patterns that you use to follow. And what's interesting about the patterns is that in many cases, the patterns look like exactly like the section in the YAML for the deployment. For example, security context, where you would just grab the security context section and put it, put it in here as a pattern and say, when you see this pattern, do this. So there's a very simple YAML logic associated with how it works. Let's go over here and see if... Uh, we, we've come to life yet. Ah, so I've got a couple of Kyvernos running. I have one running. Oh, yeah, I have multiple nodes, don't I? Well, that's cool. <laughs> it's taking its time, isn't it? Mm -hmm. All right, so let's see if one working is enough. But it was, um, so the obvious comparisons that I actually asked Jim about is like, do you get tired of, of the OPA versus Kyverno yeah. comparison? Because, um, and the answer was, of course, no, of course not, Steve. But I think he does, kind of. There's, it's, it's kind of nonstop. The, the major differentiator, I think, that he tried to convey to me was, was what we're looking at here. If you're familiar with YAML, and you're familiar with creating rules based on patterns which use YAML, mm -hmm. it, it's easy. It's like super ridiculously easy to get started. In terms of this rule, actually, I'm going to grab this rule. Oh, let's just do that. Let's do that. Go over here and assume 
either this is broken it actually is running yeah all right so let's stick the uh yeah that's awful that's not what i want to do this is why grab that again come back over here and see what works there we go groovy yeah right. and so, so i'm looking at this first policy it's pretty interesting because it's a validate is there is there a warn functionality you mean like an audit yeah so let's take a look oh yeah because there it is validation failure action enforce so i'm assuming that you can see it you can yep, see it here yep. so i could and change this to the audit it's um what do you see where where's the in here yeah so yeah if you change the spec to validation there. failure action to audit and the change default the value is audit which is smart because we don't want to just randomly yeah. enforce things yeah it reminds me of well, like policies even at stack rocks or when i was at aqua like we had audit you you can warn or you could not yeah so that was that's that's pretty cool and so you get the c pole now I'll, I'll do this other bit actually which is drive c pole uh require labels so what's kind of cool about this is we're only we only created one rule but when you look at what it did it created rules for cron job, daemon set, pod. Like it's, it's, you can see it's auto gen or what they call auto gen. Here's check for labels. You mm -hmm. see at the top. But then there's an auto gen for any other type that this would apply to. So you yeah, don't have you to remember. Because yeah. you didn't specify it, went, okay, everything. It's just going to make sure it works. So there's like a bunch, you don't realize, but there's a bunch of other stuff. Uh, kicking around in there um so it's cool i thought oh that, interesting so it's it's because it's resources kinds pod and technically cron jobs jobs everything like that are pods as well so it's going to apply it to all those resources right right and so then you get this kind of i just tried to do the thing they tell me i know it works because it's in there it'd be pretty bad if the readme didn't work so might as well do the one that works <laughs> but you see the required labels it gives you the instructions autogen etc cetera, etc cetera. so I imagine you can, because you can put the reasoning in the rule, you can make it more verbose or less verbose if you want. So it works pretty cool. So that's like the basics of getting it running. Now, where I thought it was particularly cool was here. There's a section when you go to kyverno.io policies, and then there's a, you can click through here, pod security, and it starts talking about pod security standards. And there's a method here where you can, run customize and they've got these pre-populated policies which you can go look at in pod security and you can just apply them but i was like well, screw that like i'm not going to do that i don't know what i don't know what that is so we can just do that and pipe that to new psps.yaml and let's hope that works great then cat new We can look at, there's a lot of stuff here, Jesus. All right, let's just stop there. We can look at one. So looking at pod security standards, defaults, CCTLs, and they've got a bunch of patterns, security context, CCTLs. Okay, there's a bunch of stuff here. And you get really good examples of, of Kyverno policies as well, like out of the box, if you just want to see like what are, um, well, actually, before I did the interview, I asked you if you want to ask him any questions, and you asked about defaults. And so we got to this, where he's like, oh, there's a whole bunch of defaults, actually, you can go get. And they're working actively on this pod security policy set that you can just push into place. Now, mm -hmm. whether it's good or not, or whether you think it works, is it take would take deeper analysis, I suppose. But it's just pretty cool that there's a bunch here. I, th I would recommend don't. This is actually looking really nasty on the screen. Go to that. If you go to their GitHub, actually, you can just look at the policies, and that's way, yeah. way easier to do. Policy rule match exclude. Yeah. There's the policies there. So you can just dive in, and you can work on them. And I asked them if like, they're dead keen on people getting in and taking a look at 
what these are. We can even they even have tests to test them, like as parts. So you can see for every policy, there's they have YAML that creates a pod and abuses. So you can run, you can even automate tests on your cluster using their tests. It's uh, it's it's pretty cool. So, you can also apply the policy uh, in your in your pipeline as well. So the Kyverno mm -hmm. CLI. So you, you write like the same policy file that you would be using in your cluster. It seems like you can do the same thing and just basically match it against the YAML that you want to specify mm -hmm. um, as part of your software, as part of your pipeline, and it does this exact same thing. So yeah, pretty interesting. Yeah, it's like they do, yeah, I think you're saying what they do with the equivalent of like a pre-flight check to make sure you don't yeah. need a cluster present to run it, which is neat. So the thing that also caught my attention, which was to do with this multi-tenancy thing uh, a little bit, and you can see there's a category here called multi-tenancy, but I thought it was interesting. If you click on generate, it shows you types, default types you can get where add network policy. And the example they've got, if you if we do it again, here's a generate policy that says for a, a particular namespace, always create a default deny policy. I thought this this is cool. Now, is it useful? It's a good example, but I like it. What do you think? So generate, so by default, so why is it that synchronized true? Okay, sorry, just looking at this, at network policy, okay. But validation failure action is still an audit for this example, right? Well, it is here, yeah. So what does that mean? Because does it generate and uh, not apply it? Not a clue. That's my one thing is, okay, if we're gonna generate some sort of network policy that's a default deny, um, you know, why would it be an audit? Are we doing enforce or are we just saying, hey, by the way, you're starting up a new namespace. Here's the name, here's a default deny network policy that you need to apply. Um, right. That's my one confusion. The other thing too is this works completely antithetical to how Kubernetes sets up network policies, right? For namespaces. Okay. Because it, it should be a suggestion, right? Like Kubernetes is open by default. So unless like you're working with a bunch of people and you're saying, hey, it's going to be default and I everywhere and you have to bring your own rule, otherwise you're getting nowhere, then that's fine. That just needs to be communicated, right? Oh, God, yeah, that, totally. Yeah. But I think there was a, I mean, we said in one of the shows that it would be great if people knew that they should, as part of their application, the network policy should be part of that. They should yeah. understand that they provide it alongside of everything else. Otherwise, you're you're going to get zero. It's the, it's, it's going to be default deny as opposed to default talk to everybody, anybody you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a big fan of of having like some basic benchmarks for namespaces around. Okay, well, if you don't specify what your default resources are, these are the resources you're going to get, right? And then you can kind of coach teams and developers to say, hey, if you want more, like you have to come to us or change these things. But you know, we're not going to let you go in with just open policies on resources, for example. This is pretty cool. Yeah, that's the one thing I'm a little. I probably just need to read more. But uh, like, let's say <laughs> you're you're doing a generate and you're doing a multi tenancy for like network policy. Just how does that audit versus enforce come into play? Uh, yeah, exactly. I, I it doesn't make sense there, but I think I, I, that's a maybe that's a deeper dive than I intend to do right now. Mm -hmm. Pod security standards. Yeah, the ad quota is interesting as well, too. It just generates a resource quota. Yeah, and a limit range. Yeah. So this comes back to what we were looking at earlier, which was that multi-tenancy thing we were talking about. Like the here, where he's talking about network quotas, network pol resource quotas, network policies, like these things that could be generated for each namespace. When I saw that and then saw his name on it, I thought, ah, because he's he knows if you go, well, how am I gonna do that? It's like, oh, well, you can you can do it here. And mm -hmm. you can create you can create rules in Kyverno to make things like that happen. So I thought, ah, okay, I get you, I get you. So it was I think that was one of the differences um when we spoke was that yeah, you can do validating, you can do 
mutating. But the generate one was was interesting. And he said some of the the community are creating examples of generate uh, that generate objects that have other Kyberno policies created against them. So which then kick off other Kyberno policies. So there are interesting workflows that have been created using Kyberno and the set of different policies that are there. Mm -hmm. So it's it's different. So there's my click on the multi-tenancy one. You see the network policy yeah. add quota limits and requests like they're there. I think there's a lot of power in just being Kubernetes focused too. Opposed to OPA, yeah, right. Well, I think OPA is pretty awesome if you're using it at the scale it's capable of existing within, right? At yeah. the the big beyond Kubernetes level, then you're investing in the language, you're investing in it completely. Therefore, it's no biggie to apply mm -hmm. to Kubernetes. It just seems like if you're just focusing on Kubernetes and just policy and just security, this to me seems a little easier. Yeah, and this isn't even just security. This is also operational, right? For for just setting standards too, right? Like, mm. I mean, I, I guess it's all really kind of security to a certain extent, but you know, just best practices. You're setting up a namespace. Namespace here are the defaults that come along with that, right? Like quotas. Yeah, it's funny because like quotas are just seen more as operational, but they really are security. It's because you know you have runaway containers. It's going to cause an issue, but. Yeah, this yeah, is awesome. it, it, yeah, it's pretty cool, right? So I'm not going to get too crazy into it. It was just more wanted to say, like, this is easy. I could sit, we could sit here for the rest of the show, just like doing all Kyberno, playing around with these default policies that they give you. Um, and um, what does it say if I go security? Actually, I don't know if I even collected collected that one yet. Is it the same? Disallow Helm <laughs> Tiller. <laughs> Uh, I think that was actually in a tweet I saw from Alex Alice when Kyberno first came out, and he goes, "Oh, first rule: disallow Tiller." He, uh, I think he suggested it. I don't know if it, he's the one who actually created it, but that's pretty funny. That's ages ago. All right, awesome. That's a good one. I mean, mm -hmm. I think well, we are we have already stated extras of these are certainly. Network policies default and I could fall into the security uh, zone as well. Yeah. So what, what do you think? It's, I don't know how much Kyverna you've looked into. I was pretty, I was kind of impressed by it. But I mean, obviously, uh, uh, seeing something in like a five minute demo versus using it at scale. Yeah. Who knows, right? Yeah. It looks like there's, in terms of generate, I think there's only two policies, but there's a lot more for like in enforcement or yeah so i'm looking at this right now and there's let's see so if i get rid of mutate and validate so there's like two policies for generate so quotas and network policies mm -hmm. right and then there's obviously mutate so you know node selector pod anti-affinity safe to evict adding volumes i think these are just general somebody submits things and we don't we like even though you haven't specified a node the operations is saying you you get this node and you're prioritizing mm -hmm. workloads that way which is somewhat useful and then in terms of validation like these all make sense deny privilege escalation deny capabilities uh disallow default namespaces disallow hem to helm tiller right uh, a lot of this is just saying hey we want to enforce some sort of bare minimum standard so really in terms validation is going to be where you're going to get most of the the policies but yeah it's pretty cool yeah I think it's it's early days for it, but it's I just I like when well hey, I like when documentation's good and it mm -hmm. was good and I like that I went through the the, the startup and like from a nothing kind cluster I put a policy in and I showed it worked and I thought oh okay and then there's a whole ton of click click easy interface cut and paste policies that I can. I can get started with to the point where I I already within ten minutes feel like I could confidently use this. Yeah, no, it's especially because it's YAML, and I mean it's a pretty easy install too. I'm gonna have to go do this right after. <laughs> yeah, it was just close your eyes and kubectl apply. <laughs> yeah, what could go wrong? Yeah, exactly. Just don't use Helm too. 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Don't do that. That would be uh, that would be contradictory. All right. Yeah. I think I'm gonna. I'm just gonna call it there. That was that was cool. That was. I'll, I'll probably spend a little bit more time on the the Kyverno stuff. I got really interested and do check out just to plug again. I think I told Jim that the podcast would come out in the last week of April. So if you're if you are not following Cozy Cast, look it up on all good podcast sources, and you'll get to hear me ask questions of Jim that other people don't ask because I did my usual thing and I watched him on OpenShift Commons. Twenty eighth of April will come out, and I watched all the questions. They're all very like soft softballs, and I asked questions like, "Nirmana started in twenty thirteen. Where you been? Like this has been like <laughs> eight years, and suddenly I've just heard of of Caverno, right?" So it's he's he's a good guy and he did a great he was very patient with me and my questioning. So do listen and go check out Kyrono. Awesome. All right, are we done? We're done. That's it. Longest show ever. Yeah, we'll go for the record. Maybe we'll try to top it next week. All right. Very cool. Thanks everybody. Thank you, viewer or viewers. That's Michael on DSO training. Mm -hmm. our, our buddy michael man very cool thank you for tuning in hope you enjoyed everything uh and we're back next week back next week same time all right amazing uh then we'll sign off my name's steve Chaguer. and i'm mike foster all right thanks for watching <laughs> <laughs>